What's up, SBSers? We are back with another audiophile happy hour. Of course, I am Nick, uh, here with uh, President Gary. Gary, how you doing tonight? I'm, I'm missing Ed. Where's Ed? It just feels weird. He's been with like he's been with us on every one of these. But no, hey, it's great to see uh, to be a part of uh, uh, our happy hour again. I, I missed our our community. I'm looking at the comments flying by. It's been I think has it been three weeks, Nick? Um, it's been three weeks. So it's it's super great to be together again, and really looking forward to uh, spending an hour with you guys. Just so you know how cool Ed is, he has a side hustle fixing chainsaws. So if you ever need a <laughs> chainsaw restored, Ed Mullen is your man, and he knows more about audio than than all of us combined. So uh, there you go, a little tidbit about Ed. Hey, of course, leave yourself have... in that one, not me. <laughs> That's true, I will. Uh, and of course, we have our national trading manager, hashtag the Larry. I'm going back to that again, Larry, sorry. How are you doing this evening? Sorry. I am good, man. It's uh, it's a good day here. I got my voice back, so it's been uh, messed that's up. That's a mixed blessing. Yeah, it's like uh, 10 days it's been messed up, so uh, I'm glad to have it back thanks to some funky weather, but excited for our guest tonight, excited for Mavericks kicking off tonight, so it's, uh, it's a good night. Well, we'll get to that, and I am dubbing this the playoff edition of the Audiophile Happy Hour because we have a very special uh, guest. His name is Glendon Rush. He's been with us before, 12-year veteran of Major League Baseball, so we'll bring him out in a little bit. He's got some really Charles, it's Peruvian. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about the, the <laughs> mat in the background. I thought you blurred your background so you wouldn't get the questions about that. I can't blur it on this, this whatever this app is that you use. Oh, Okay. Well, I'm wearing my. But in case anyone uh, wonders why I, why I have a, a a Peruvian tapestry behind me, it's um I've, I've never really told people, but I get asked all the time. But it's it's about a half inch thick and has um, acoustic dampening qualities. And I have uh, multiple speakers in front of me in my office, which you guys can't see because they're all prototypes and you're not allowed. Um, but that way I can hear uh, uh, hear the sound without much back reflection. Well, we might have to add that to the uh, SVS accessory shop there for uh, for uh, anyone who wants to tapestry. Yeah, an SVS tapestry. I think that'd be That's awesome. Right. Maybe we'll get yeah. your face, Gary, on it or something like that. We can we can sell those like hotcakes. Uh, oh yeah, my for face. Anyone who, my face. That will sell us, a tapestry. <laughs> joining us for the first time on the Audiophile Happy Hour. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to answer some of your questions, and we'll also have some fantastic giveaways. To be eligible for the giveaways, all you have to do is leave a comment. So all you folks now who are chiming in and asking questions in the uh, comments there, you are eligible already. And our man Vince is working behind the scenes. He'll pull names. We'll announce them live on air, and then we'll take care of shipping them out here within a day or two. So that's how it works. And to tell us about the awesome giveaways that we have tonight, Larry, it's the tradition for you to run through those. So why don't you uh, knock them out here real quick? Well, as you know, we do four as always. So the first one we give away is a pair of Prime Wireless powered bookshelf speakers, then a pair of Prime Elevation speakers, which are number one selling speakers, an SB1000 Pro subwoofer, followed up at the end of the night to wrap things up, and a, a 3000 Micro subwoofer. So we're giving away our two newest products. Pretty exciting. That is very exciting. And uh, as is the tradition, we like to kick things off here on the Audiophile Happy Hour and talk a little bit about what we've been tuning into recently. Uh, and I will go first tonight, but I'll first say I want to throw a plug out to a local distillery, Sons of Liberty. I'm enjoying a pumpkin spice bourbon tonight. So they make pumpkin spice bourbon. And it's actually fantastic. So it's a small batch. Uh, so there you go. Sons of Liberty, if you want to check that out. And uh, like the rest of the world, I've been watching Squid Game. I actually finished it. I uh, really, truly enjoyed it. Although, the mask that I ordered is not going to be here in time for Halloween. So, Gary, you were mocking is, me. Is this our is this our Halloween show? I mean, uh, if you think I about it, it, sort of is. It's our playoff show. So I was I didn't know. Oh, did you did you come prepared, Gary? Should I put my mask on? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> wow, that's unexpected. I think it is our Halloween show, right? Well, I didn't come prepared, so maybe I'll have to run up and, uh, and get a catcher's mask or something and, and throw that on real quick. But uh, that's I nice think Gary now has to keep that on for the rest of the broadcast. You sure. Oh, wow. Lights up, too. Pyrotechnics. Very cool. Well, there it's amazing you go. what $7 will get you on Amazon. That is that is a, a true <laughs> display of awesomeness there. So thank you. All right, for now sharing. I got to scan the comments. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, as I was saying, I've been uh, tuning into Squid Game. Uh, I'll reserve a comment about that in case anyone hasn't seen it. And then uh, Major League Baseball, they've had some very interesting cuts of commercial music, and one of those being uh, Fish, which was a band I used to listen to a lot back in my cooler days. Uh, so I've been getting back on the Fish train, doing some noodle dancing and, uh, you know, how that works. So 
Uh, those are two things. And then I checked out uh, Dave Chappelle's The Closer, which uh, a lot of controversy around that, so we won't go into that. But um, that's kind of what I've been tuning into. Uh, Larry, what's been uh, hot on your uh, playlist here recently? So I, I got I got into Squid Game. I'm about five episodes in. Haven't had a chance to finish it yet. I've uh, been working rather heavily on recording a bunch of videos for our company for training purposes and stuff. Uh, getting ready for NBA, listening to the Metallica Blacklist album, which has been a lot of fun. I heard I there was somebody guys... who wanted to give you, you to give a review of that. So uh, maybe not in depth, but uh, maybe we can get around to some of your thoughts on uh, that album. All right. Probably on our next one, maybe I'll come up with some of my favorite tracks off of there. Um, and then uh, something just more, you guys know I my the band that brought my wife and I together, Flicker Stick. They've been apart for years, but got back together to uh, release a new CD, and it just came out this past week. And uh, I bought two of them, one to just kind of hang on to, but uh, went back and released some stuff that they had never put out. And 20 years ago next week, I met my wife, and it was all because of this band. So uh, it's a pretty important CD to us and our life and all that stuff. So I was really stoked for it, and I've been listening to that like crazy. Very cool. Uh, and I think Flickerstick, as I said on the last one, is getting more pub out of these audiophile happy hours than I think they get probably anywhere else. So kudos to you. Probably. For, uh, awareness. Uh, and kudos to you for, uh, you know, your, your wife's anniversary and, and you next week. That's a, a good reason to celebrate. Gary, what do you got for us? You've had some interesting recommendations uh, lately, some surprise I, ones. I, I'm going to have a really weird one, but I, I, I will say if it's a, if really interesting how fast things move because we had a show three weeks ago and I said, my my family is freaking out over this squid thing, um, especially my youngest son, who's not that young anymore. He's 21. Um, and uh, remember, we didn't even know Nick, Nick and Larry, you'd never heard of it. And um, uh, I said, it's squid something. Three weeks later, we've all watched it. Um, I loved it, although my analysis of squid game is they they went south after the first five episodes and got weird i i personally thought it 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 kind of took some weird turns but i really really loved that show i thought it was really cool and i understand why it's the the number one um show now i'm going to tell you some music that i'm listening to which is uh um not normal um but i i do recommend it um Cardi B did this video of her of her Latin tinged song, and um, uh, she had as her guest uh, one of her guests this dude Bad Bunny. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. Um, Bad Bunny was a bagger in a supermarket in Puerto Rico, um, and somehow uh, mo moved up in reggaeton. Reggaeton is a particular kind of music. Um, it's got a weird beat. And it's usually completely in Spanish. But Bad Bunny is uh, one of the biggest stars on the planet right now. If you don't know who he is, he just he, he he's filling arenas all over the country. He's in a Corona and beer commercial, too, I think. He's cool. And anyway, I just thought it was cool. He was a bagger in a supermarket. So he gets his break, his big break to be on this Cardi B video on the American Music Awards. And he makes his entrance in a shopping cart. He's like totally <laughs> owning his roots. Um, but he has an album that's all initials. That's how you'll know. And I think it's really, really good. And it sounds good. Now it's 100%. It's reggaeton and it's in Spanish. So it's going to be different. But um, I'm recommending it. That's my recommendation that and for the like two people on this show that haven't seen Squid Game, it's definitely worth it. Well, you all, you never cease to uh, surprise me there with your music recommendations. They're all over the place, but uh, there you go. Bad Bunny from Gary. Um, so before we dive These into- These people are surprised that I even listen to Cardi B. Bad Bunny, that's another, that's well, even a more of a left turn. Taylor Swift and Billie Eilish and stuff though. That's true. That's true. Oh, and the other thing, can I say? I went I, I went to my my first truly big time rock show, I, I you know, I get to do I had a meeting with um, actually my partner in Las Vegas on Saturday and the night before that in Las Vegas, their only their whole tour was only three nights was one of our favorite bands, uh, System of a Down. So I'm in T-Mobile Arena in Vegas, and that was truly a cathartic experience. I, re I, re I truly enjoyed it. And, and everyone who was there was so happy to be there. It was such fun. 
Well, I would love to throw out a plug. I have uh, my wife and I are going to see Pentatonix uh, in uh, Foxwoods Casino. And uh, she is actually the, the lead singer or the, the female singer who's uh, in the group is an SB16 Ultra owner there. So a little plug for uh, our products there. And, and she uh, loves it, right? She did she actually did a feature it, with yeah. you. Yep. Yeah. And uh, and so there's uh, Kristen Maldonado. Kirsten Maldonado, yep, and uh, they're a uh, acapella group, and uh, you know it's a great date night out at the casino. So we'll find a way to have some fun there uh, outside the concert, but it should be a good time. Um, so before we dive into our first topic, I did want to throw a quick plug. If you can't get enough of Larry hey, Jay Hill, yes, yeah, System of a Down is still around, but they all hate each other. So they they like I think they can only stand each other for like a tour of like three dates, and then they're done. But it was really fun. <laughs> Sorry, I'm watching the comments. I'm, I'm talking in real time to our, our gang here. I know. Hopefully there's not too much of a delay. Otherwise, it seems really random. There's also a tornado Hall, warning in Ohio Hall, right now. Fox City it. celebrated its 20th anniversary uh, like two weeks ago, um, which is a lot of people think is their best album. Good recommendation. So uh, I was going to say real quick, if you can't get enough of Larry and I on these audio file happy hours, next week we're going to be appearing live on the AV Summit which is a, uh, a sort of virtual trade show put together by some of the, the YouTube reviewers and uh, audio guys out there. Um, and we're going to be talking all about different products and optimization and doing some giveaways. So check out the AVSummit.com if you want to be a part of that. Uh, there's some other brands involved as well, uh, not as cool as us, but there's still going to be a, a great sort of opportunity to interact directly with a lot of these uh, these different audio brands. So check it out. Uh, I know uh, Youth Man's involved as well as Joe Intel, uh, Techno Dad, a couple of these guys have really worked hard to put this thing together, and kudos to them. You know, with the whole COVID thing going on, to really bring the community together, I think it's a great opportunity. So the AVSummit.com is where you can find info on that. Uh, so last guest we had, Todd Anderson from AV Nirvana, had talked a little bit about the Kaleidoscape service, and I think we got a little bit harsh when we were judging uh, some of the streaming platforms out there in terms of the sound quality and whatnot. So we wanted to bring the topic back up and talk a little bit about optimizing them because. I think they've made all of our lives a lot better when it comes to access to content. So with that being said, Larry, I'm going to kick it to you first. And, uh, you know, basically when you're setting up your home theater and you have these various streaming services, what are the things you can do to make sure they sound as good as possible? Well, first, you've got to look at your, your streaming account because there are services that offer premium audio if you have a step up account, like with Netflix, you don't get uh, Dolby Atmos or 4K with the standard account, you've got to move up to their enhanced service. So that's one thing you really got to check out. Um, and then looking at what each of the services offer. So Amazon, uh, Apple TV, Netflix, HBO Max, all these services that are out there offer 4K, HDR now, and Atmos. So what you have to then make sure is that your uh, settings on the device that you're streaming from is also correct there too and i think you go back to looking you know we buy a lot of discs and stuff for our demos and stuff but i don't let my kids play with the discs. that's where the streaming comes into play so it's really convenient for all of that as well but um the settings on like your apple tv you've got to go in and make sure the advanced audio is turned on inside your television if television if you're running something like arc or eARC, you got to make sure that the digital output is set properly there too and it's different per brand but making sure your advanced audio settings are all correct is the biggest one. And I, I know Sony's got a lot of video settings you've got to adjust to for 4K, but streaming can really make your life a lot easier. And it's, it will never be quite as good as a disc, but it's still, it's, it's great for a lot of people. I, and I, it's and the best thing I actually get. asked Nick to, to introduce this topic because our guest uh, in the last show, he was really, really good. But I think he's used to talking to people with lots and lots and lots of disposable <laughs> income. He's like, you really have to get the Kaleidoscape. Listen, Kaleidoscape is fine. It's really, it's a cool product. It's very expensive, the Kaleidoscape. And and um, I don't have one. Uh, and I do get discs, um, and they are great. But the truth is, streaming with Dolby Atmos on Apple TV um, or Netflix, um, uh, or uh, HBO Max has been a really nice experience for me. And, you know, I can go down after our show and get um, Dune um, in full on Dolby Atmos and watch it without buying the disc, without waiting. Um, and if I decide I don't want to watch um, Dune, I, I don't have to. Or if I want to, I'm, I'm with no notice, I can. 
Um, and Larry's exactly right, though. Don't assume you have Dolby Atmos until you set it up. And there's three things you got to set up. Um, the one thing I think you, you you actually sometimes have to go into the app itself, like in other words, the settings on Netflix or the settings on HBO Max, and tell the app to output Dolby Atmos. Then, of course, as Larry says, the player, whatever streaming device you're using, you need to tell it to do that. And um, and then hopefully you have a receiver that confirms that it's getting Dolby Atmos. Um, and then you'll see that reflected on the screen. And is it as good as the full on disc? No. But does it sound phenomenal in a great home theater? Yes. Yeah, and so I, I think hear we comments, may be uh, having Facebook some screen issues. Yeah, so yeah. YouTube, it's also being broadcast on. You don't need an account. You can just go to our YouTube channel. Um, but uh, we're, we're obviously uh, looking to do whatever we can to fix it. But uh, check it out on YouTube if uh, obviously you're not seeing this on Facebook. But it is uh, an option there, too. Um, so is it so, Facebook? Do we know that? Yeah, we should tell Facebook. people. Yep, it's just Facebook. So uh, it's working fine on YouTube. It's Facebook that's glitching out. So, uh, you know, again, sorry, guys. Uh, yep. But, uh, you know, if you are tuning in, you're able to see it on YouTube, then uh, jump over there. Uh, but we're actually due for our first giveaway, and then we're going to bring out our guest there. But I thought you guys did a great overview of uh, the streaming services. And I also, one other thing I wanted to add to that was uh, not all of them sort of behave the same. I feel like some of them you have to turn up a little louder. Uh, some of them, you know, have their their mixes a little bit hotter. So, you know, from service to service, you'll actually notice that the output can change. And that's completely normal. And I think everyone notices it. So um, something to just consider when uh, when you're working with them, that not all your settings might be, uh, be the same from service to service. Maybe so I'm seeing that, from the comments that Facebook is working now. All right. Yeah, excellent. Glad Confirm that, glad guys. I'm watching your comments. Is it working for you? Sorry it's for the problems. I think we need yeah. to give them. Let's do an extra giveaway with our apologies. Can we do two <laughs> right now? You can do whatever you want, Gary. But let me. I'm asking. You I'm asking well, nicely. Yeah, we need to have a winner, and so uh, if Vince, I know you're watching. Uh, let's pick another winner. What, what What's the what is what is the prize? Uh, the first one is a Prime Wireless powered speaker system. So, so let's give away those? two Prime Wireless powered speaker systems to two people. Vince, I need you to soup up the randomizer. All right, here it is. Give our us two people. Winner, while you're uh, while you're uh, searching through there, uh, Vince, our very first winner of a Prime Wireless powered speaker system is Paul Corey. Congratulations, Paul Corey. You got awesome. yourself a nice new pair of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth enabled power. Books yes, it's my Oprah people. imitation. Who said? Who said? Somebody saying you get a car and you get a car. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we're, we'll. Do we do two? Do we do both? Our, uh, discussion with Glendon to announce the second giveaway winner, uh, but it, it's coming here any second. I, no, uh, we should. I'm, oh, you're waiting for the randomizer. I'm waiting for it. It's got to be random. It's the world's slowest randomizer. I know. <laughs> it's part of it. All right. Uh, well, with that, while we're waiting, uh, I'm sure uh, Glendon will be forgiving of us while we. Uh, while we work through our giveaways. But uh, I want to welcome a 12-year veteran of Major League Baseball. He's a phenomenal ambassador for the game. He's an owner of uh, a couple SBS subwoofers and a pair of Ultra Bookshelf speakers. Glendon, how the heck are you tonight? I think you're muted, too. So you, you might want to un, uh, unmute your... You want to hear what you have to say, Glendon. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. There he is. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing great and great to see you guys. Uh, I always follow you guys and obviously enjoy my... SVS equipment on a regular basis. Well, well you were one of the most popular guests we've had. Everybody really yes, enjoyed all your insights, not just about um, audio. They definitely enjoyed that, but also about baseball and sports. It was cool. Thank you. Yeah, well, we'll, uh, we'll talk some all of the above tonight. How's that? Let's do it. Can't wait. So, of course, we have to ask you uh, what you are drinking tonight. And then I think you have some uh, music recommendations as well. So what can you share with us? I do. I'm drinking a... Uh, a Probably not good for me. A Bang Rainbow Unicorn Energy Drink. And uh, <laughs> my music recommendations are all over the map tonight. I uh, I started off being completely blown away and loved the new Iron Maiden album. I don't know if you wow. guys heard that at all. Um, I, and I'm not a long time Iron Maiden fan. I, I like some of their music, but this new album I think is just incredible. I love it. Um, and then I go completely kind of on the other side of the radar with uh, the new Brandy Carlisle album, I think is really good. Um, I like that too. I think it's really good. Yeah. I'm and glad then, you mentioned that. I, I would have mentioned it. I didn't think of it. 
Yeah, that's a great one. And then my my uh, my longtime good buddy and Cubs fan Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine has just released a solo album uh, that's got some really cool stuff on it. It's got a Highway to Hell with Bruce Springsteen and Eddie Vedder. It's got a, he does a song with Chris Stapleton, a, kind of a country rock metal song. So there's some cool stuff there. So check it out. Absolutely. I love Very those recommendations. Cool. You, you're not kidding all over the uh, the map with those, uh, but I think it'll give us some good uh, demo ideas there uh, for our... Uh, and did you see our favorite season. band has announced a worldwide tour? Yes, I did see that, and I spoke with uh, Danny recently about... We're talking about Tool, SBS yes, community. But, uh, Tool is going back out on the road, along with Rage Against the Machine in 2022, so I'm already mapping out uh, places, locations, and dates for those shows, because... Uh, I love it. And nice work, Gary, on System of the Down. I love them. And that's so cool that you got to see them recently. I, everyone was so excited to be at a, you know, a full on, you know, no holds barred show in a in a, in a big uh, room. It was really, really fun. One guy was so excited he threw up right in front of me, although I have a feeling <laughs> there might have been more going on there than just excitement. <laughs> Well, we uh, we just had the uh, huge Louder Than Life Festival here in, in Louisville, Kentucky, and I went out and watched some of that. So, yes, uh, same sediments here. Everyone was so excited, I think, to be out of the house and see live music again. Yep. It was great. Yep. So we are going to get around to talking some uh, audio, but I did want to get some uh, impressions of yours uh, because we are in the heart of uh, the Major League Baseball playoffs right now. And uh, just general uh, sense of what your impressions are so far. And I think, Gary, you wanted him to pick winners too. Is that right? Well, I'm just kind of weirded out that the Dodgers are like almost out of it. I'm rooting for the Dodgers because they have two nationals uh, that they took from us, Max <laughs> Scherzer and Trey Turner. So uh, at least gives me something to root for. Well, uh, I'm glad you guys brought me on the show now and not before the playoffs started because my predictions would have been terrible. Uh, so they've, <laughs> they've improved. Um, I actually was fortunate enough last week to take both of my sons to Atlanta. We drove over, and I took them to games one and two of the NLCS, and it was phenomenal. I'd never seen the new Braves stadium. The atmosphere was incredible. The fans, the whole deal, I got to see two great games. Uh, we had a blast. I'm, I think the Braves are going to beat your Dodgers, Gary, yep. and, and I think that – um, the You're Astros right. are going to beat the Red Sox and upset everyone that, that thinks that the Red Sox are going to steamroll them. And, you know, with everything that's gone on with the Astros, I don't root for them because of that, but I do root for them because Dusty Baker's their manager, and I had him for three years in Chicago, and he's one of my favorite managers I've ever had and, and really a really good friend. So I, I am rooting for them. So I, I think we're going to see Astros, Braves, and I think the Braves are going to win the World Series this year. There you Tell go. you what, they sure look strong against the Dodgers. I wouldn't have predicted they would be this, you know, they're just beating up on them. So I'd say they more are. so than any time this year, Glendon, um, you know, the way starters and the bullpens have been used is just much different. And I'm wondering what your take is on that. You know, you see starters getting pulled in the second inning after only giving up a run or two. Like what's what's the mentality behind there? And, and is this part of the game evolving or just what's your general take? Well, I think the games in, uh, evolved from an analytical standpoint. Um, we used analytics back when I played and before I played and everything else it just wasn't maybe as advanced as it is now. But when you look at the matchups that they have with these relief pitchers who are very, very good. Every single guy that comes out of that bullpen has great stuff now. Um, and, and the way they match up against the other lineups, they, they feel that they have a better opportunity to, to put up a bunch of zeros that way than, than we used to see the old battles of two guys going seven or eight innings against each other, right? Which, which to me is really fun to watch, and I do miss that part of it. Um, but I understand the way they're using the pens now. I think it's difficult for the relievers. I think they tire them out, and I think the guys are probably burned by now. But uh, it's playoffs and adrenaline and World Series and a chance to win some hardware, so I think they'll battle through it. So as a pitcher, you were uh, you had a, a special pace that you worked at, and I know that's been a big discussion about making the game shorter. Do you think the games need to be shorter? Do you think that Major League Baseball needs to take action there? Or you know, what's your take on that, sort of the length of the game and, and how that's uh, sort of evolving? I think it's impossible to take any action that's going to shorten the game up with, with the way, uh, you, look, they make billions of dollars from TV revenue, right? So that's, th those are going to stay the same, the, the commercial breaks and everything else that they make the money from. 
I get frustrated when the actual pace of play is very slow, when a relief pitcher comes in. And it could be a starter, too, that works really slow and methodical on every pitch and it takes forever. That frustrates me because I was a quick worker and I love to get the ball back, be ready to pitch and keep the action going. Um, but I don't think they're ever going to shorten the games up. I think true baseball fans enjoy the game for what it is. It's a beautiful game. There's so many different variables within the game. And there and there's no time clock, right? It's the only really the only sport that's that's like that. Well, yeah. the irony is the shortest games are the ones that have the fewest hits. And so, you know, so I personally love a pitcher's battle, but but um, some people might view that as not as exciting anyway. So it's just interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if we asked you this uh, last time, but uh, one of my favorite things to hear from uh, from any professional athlete is what do you think the most unbreakable record in your sport is? And uh, I'm curious what your take is, because I have my opinion. Oh, gosh. Um, the hit streak, I think. Um, I don't know if that could ever be broken. Demasi nobody's ever going to break Nobody's ever gonna break Cal Ripken's streak. Um, that's cool. What about Nick and I were talking about? Yeah, that was got Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I want to hear what you have to say. I was going to say I don't. I don't think um, anyone's going to come anywhere near that one. And and the hit streak too is. And and here's why the hit streak is so difficult because of what we just talked about the specialized pitching and a, a great hitter. One of those games along that streak is it might he might end up facing four different pitchers that game, and three of them are specialized matchups against him. So I think that's going to be uh, tough for that one ever to be broken. Yeah, uh, and I I have one for you just because I'm a homer and I and I love uh, uh, the Nationals. <laughs> I'm not going to lead the witness, but we have some really exciting young players, hitters coming up. Who do you think? Uh, and you, if you say Juan Soto, I'll be very happy. But no, I, I didn't mean to lead the witness there. Who do you think is the most exciting young hitter that's coming up right now and and could and, and almost guaranteed Hall of Famer? Well, there's no doubt Juan Soto is. I got to see him live this year, actually, in, in uh, Tampa. I took my kids to a game there, and he hit a home run to dead center the night we went. I think he is by far one of the best all-around, most exciting hitters in baseball right now. Uh, unfortunately, Ronald Acuna Jr. is hurt. Um, I think he's unbelievable. And I got to see Fernando Tatis Jr. when I was coaching with the Padres. as a He was either 17 or 18 years old when we traded for him, and – I mean, he's a special, special talent. So those three guys jump out uh, to me. I'm sure I'm missing some guys, but but those guys are incredible. Bryce Harper, I know he's not that young anymore. Bryce is an – He's having a phenomenal – he had a phenomenal season. Yes, he's an incredible player. And, and unfortunately, I think he gets lost in the shuffle a little bit now. I don't think he gets the credit um, that he's due for going out there and doing it every single year and putting up the numbers he does. He's yeah. He, he's a highly valuable asset, and I would take him in my lineup any day. We should we should ask. Glendon's very passionate about music and sound, and I and I know that so is our SBS community. We should we should switch it up and start and ask uh, Glendon some of those. Yeah, I'm I'm moving on here. I I just I needed to get some of those questions out there for my me own too. I I'm, I'm and I can love talk talking baseball, baseball with Glendon. Tonight. Uh, and it but seems I whatever was going on with our stream seems to be fixed too. I don't think it's anything we were doing. I it, I think it's actually the the service we're using. Tonight it's the Streamyard you know. service. We're gonna yeah. fix that. Or, but it looks yeah, to be better sorry, though. Yep. Um, so I am gonna do that uh, extra giveaway you mentioned, uh, Gary. We're giving away a second Prime Wireless uh, powered speaker system, and uh, the winner of that is John Klein. John Klein. Hey, John. At the end also, of the earned it by watching our paused video. Yeah. I'll. Uh, <laughs> Facebook people saying it's frozen again, but I'm going to run through all the winners again at the very end here, just uh, for anyone who may have been uh, glitching out there while we're, we're going through this. So um, we were talking a little bit before we jumped on about uh, public enemy. And, and I thought it was really interesting. I saw on Twitter and I'm going to share my screen here real quick uh, that Chuck D who is one of the founding members of uh, public enemy did this uh, painting of you. And I just wondered what the backstory is here behind, uh, you know, Chuck D from public enemy doing a, a painting of uh, Glendon rush. Well, yeah, that, it was a, a pretty cool deal. He, I got to know Chuck a little bit. He's a, obviously a, um, a New Yorker and a longtime Mets fan and has done a bunch of collaborative stuff with, with my buddy Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine and, and was one of the dual front men when they did that uh, project, Prophets of Rage. Um, him and Be Real were the two front men that, that fronted that group. And 
all of a sudden a while ago this popped up and I was like, wow, that is really cool. And I sent him a message and said, Hey, um, can I have it? And, and he was laughing like, oh, of course, sure. And so, so he, uh, I, I brought it out for you guys. So he, he sent it to me and, and, uh, wrote on it and, uh, signed it. Um, so I have it here at the house and it's a really cool piece of memorabilia. And I'm, uh, very appreciative that Chuck included me in all his works. If you, if you keep an eye on what he does and what he puts out on Twitter and everything, he does some really cool artwork and all, all over the place. But, uh, actually did a um a video about the 71 mlb all-star game and did original kind of an original hip-hop um version to it naming all the players and everything and um guys that he you know remembered as childhood heroes and everything so he's he's a great baseball historian and just a fun guy to hang out with and and talk to i think that's so cool and uh, you know gary Very has a cool. personal connection to public enemy as well with uh, one of their founding members so i just found that to be really interesting yeah i'm friends with hank shockley who's also one of their found founding members and he's also still a very active um, music producer but he's also active in tech and um it's i think it's official he will be uh, inducted into the consumer technology hall of fame in november i'll be there in new york uh for that that, that's cool. It's it's crazy to see how that a band has evolved over time and where the different uh, members of it have gone. Um, and I, I think the last time we spoke, Glendon, you had mentioned that Mike Piazza was the one who got you into high performance audio. And I'm curious if you've played that role with anybody, uh, you know, in terms of bringing them in and sort of sharing your passion. And if you can give tips to people out there, because we actually hear it a lot in the comments is like, how can I get people to embrace this? So I'm just curious what your path has been like in, in that term. Yeah, I mean, I talk to people all the time about it. Um, sometimes, pro sometimes probably more than they want to hear. Um, but I, I actually had a, a story recently with um, a really good buddy of mine that I grew up with and went to high school with was putting together a system, and he was talking to me about you know what should I get and what what's out there, and so I kind of led him down the path of check out the SVS stuff, and he started asking me questions, and by the end of it, he ended up. Um, you know, getting an SB 1000 and, um, and a pair of bookshelves. Uh, and he absolutely loves it. Um, he's running it with a, uh, a small little amplifier and he has a, uh, he has a turntable now and everything and just kind of gotten into audio recently and absolutely loves it. Yeah. And I feel like that it's always, you know, some people are actually actively seeking it out, but, um, a lot of times it's more a matter of engaging them around the content that they really truly like. And, you know, I think when people are exposed to songs they've heard a hundred times, but on a great system, it becomes so much more like of an emotional experience, almost like a spiritual connection that they have with that artist or with that content, uh, because they've never heard it the way it could actually sound at its best. So, you know, I, I just find that really interesting that, uh, you know, path that people take to get there. It um, is. It's, it's so much fun to, to sit back and listen to music on, on a great system. And, and the cool thing that you guys do is... The, you, you have the ability to put together an incredible system at not that much money. I mean, when, when Piazza got me into it way back in the day, 21 plus years ago, it was somewhat of a fortune to, to put together, you know, an amplifier and a set of towers and a sub and everything that went along with it and your CD player and you weren't streaming at that time. And it was thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And you look what you guys can do with a wireless sound base and a pair of bookshelves and a, you know, micro 3000. I mean, you can have an incredible system for uh, something that, that people can actually afford. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad that, you uh, said that. I mean, we're all about bringing reference experiences to more people, you know, and we don't want to be thought of as a value brand, but we do want to bring really high performance to people that, as you know, if you have, if you earn a paycheck, you should be able, if it's in your priorities you should be able to own a nice system like that and and so thanks for saying that it means a lot absolutely i i i um I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about it but i'll i'll give you guys my two cents on what i think of the micro 3000 because you guys were uh i had one of those on order and got one of the first ones shipped out when you guys released it well, I, we we never fish for compliments, so you just need to say it. But um, <laughs> well, uh, I was I was gonna put it. We're, we're you you know, say, I'm gonna say, Glendon, we have you on here because you're you, and your your insights are really interesting, and and uh, 
Um, but if you want to tell us what you think, I'm bracing myself. Hopefully you like it. Yeah, so I so I, I used it with um, – go ahead, Nick. You got, you got something? No, no. I did, you're going to answer the question I'm going to ask, so just fire away. Okay, cool. I, uh, I, I When I got it, I tried it with, um, you know, a, a couple different amplifiers, and I tried it with a couple different sets of bookshelves, one being the, the Ultras, and I also tried it with um, a set of the Kef Metas. And I put them in a room that's just a kind of a small living room area and, and on each side of a fireplace and just started playing music. And that Micro 3000 is absolutely phenomenal for the size and um, whatever room it is. I haven't used it in a large room. That's a, I guess I would consider it a medium sized room, but it, it it's, completely disappears into the music and which I know is a great trait. I don't know how to describe it from a technical standpoint, um, whether it's transparency or however you want to, whatever word you want to use, but it is awesome. And uh, I, I can't tell you how much I like it. It, it really impressed me. Um, I've got the SB uh, 2000 pro up in my, my other loft with the towers, but um, using that micro with a set of bookshelves is, awesome so i highly recommend it for anybody out there that's looking to put together that kind of a system yeah it, it's been a lot of fun to play with for sure i've got it here in my office under the desk and then whenever i've gone out and done some trainings here locally in dallas i've taken it with me and went into a store that had done uh put some in-wall speakers on a wall and they were all metal braced behind the wall and we cranked that thing up and you could hear all the metal in the wall it was one of the greatest experiences uh, ever in a store that something so compact was able to just rattle that store to its core. You know, the best way I've heard it described with, you know, subwoofer blending with speakers is it melts into the speakers. Like you have no idea that you're even listening to a subwoofer because all of the output coming from the speakers just sounds like it's got a more full and deeper low end. And I feel like that's a lot of times what, what people don't really understand about subwoofers. It's not this box that sits in the corner and makes noise. It actually produces bass that sounds like it's coming from all the speakers, no matter where they are set up around you when it's properly dialed in. So I think that's uh, really a comment that you were, uh, you know, sort of alluding to there when you're talking about the micro. That's funny you said that because there was multiple times where I actually would go back and forth and double check, like, do I have it on? Yes, it's on. Okay, what setting do I have it at? How loud is it? You know, it's it's really a a cool dance that you do as you set when as you set it up and listen to different songs that are give you the right you know that give you a good reference you listen to good stuff that you you know the, exactly how the song sounds and you've heard it a thousand times and it's cool and you know the the 3000 micro um i i wasn't sure what to expect we had some odd reviewers from the audiophile community that took it and um they're all over it. It got a really killer review in Stereophile magazine. Those guys are are are. Uh, they're not even really usually subwoofer guys, and um, they just really embraced it. Um, and uh, uh, Steve Gutenberg, who is the audiophiliac, I've been saying it wrong on yes. YouTube. He he loved it, and when those audiophile kind of guys embraced three thousand micro, they've embraced some others of our products, but I didn't expect this. I think you're right, Glendon, that it, it really does disappear into the music. And that, that it also does a really good job. I, I found one of the things that struck me about it was it defines those notes very clearly. Like if you're listening to an acoustic bass, you hear all the notes, no matter how, no matter where they are in the, in the frequency spectrum and they're defined exactly the way they should be. So um, it's, it sounds, like a full range speaker only it's only delivering the bass yeah it is, it's awesome and, and, and since we're doing a baseball show you guys hit a home run yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a softball thanks there for so um you know I, I one of the things about this hobby is we all tend to get upgrade itis at some point so i'm curious if you're eyeing anything as far as an upgrade for any part of your home theater any of your uh, your hi-fi systems that you have in your home glendon what's what's next on the uh, menu for uh, upgrades in terms of your systems well, the one upgrade I've, I've wanted to work on for a while at some point is possibly uh, going dual subs in my um, uh, home theater downstairs. Uh, I'm still using an old Krell Resolution Series sub from I bought that set of speakers back in the day. And I think 2004, I'm like 17 years going on 
on that setup. So uh, at, at some point, I'll probably hit you guys up and go with um, dual subs down there and, and really get after it, shake the whole house. I Now, are you – and I don't want to. I'm again going to lead the witness. Are, would your plan be to keep the Krell in there along with the subs? For sure. For now, I love those speakers. Um, those are those are like uh, my babies. I got those big, huge towers, like I said, 17 years ago, and they sound phenomenal. And I spent too much money on them, and they work <laughs> wonderfully, and they sound they sound great. So yeah, I'll probably stick with those for a while until um, until I really decide to change everything out but yeah for now well the beauty of it, it is fun to change things out i do it all I, I mean obviously this is what i do but but i do it all the time well i think the beauty of subwoofers too is you don't need to match them with speakers you know you can have uh, as long as it's a great subwoofer it's only going to enhance the quality of your whole entire sound stage and you know it doesn't matter if they're brand agnostic or whether they uh you know they're completely different as long as the subwoofer is doing what it does well uh this is gary your whole objective subjective uh conversation that you like to have with speakers and subwoofers you know they're just yeah. a different beast this is true they are and Kel kelly my wife will be emailing you soon gary to tell tell you uh, not to be uh, promoting me changing things out all the time <laughs> You just have to, what I do with my wife is make her my partner in crime. Like she, she's like, when are we getting a better this or that? And that's what I, that's the dynamic I need. Good idea. That's good advice. I like that. <laughs> so I'm going to do one another giveaway here. Show. We have five giveaways to do tonight since uh, Gary, you added another one on. And then uh, we'll have a couple more questions by, for by Glendon. Throwing another uh, one in there. But our next uh, giveaway is going to be a uh, pair of prime elevation speakers, the most versatile high performance speaker in the world. And the winner of, the pair of prime elevations is Roger Coble. Congratulations, Roger Coble. You are awesome. the owner of some new prime mm -hmm. elevation speakers. So are you running any uh, Dolby Atmos in your home theater, uh, Glendon, or is that uh, in the, the future upgrade path? That's in the future upgrade path as well. I'm, I'm still old, old school 5.1. All right. Well, you got a, a good solution with the SBS Prime Elevation if it comes to that. So, uh, you know, don't don't let, uh, you know, don't let that wait too long, because I, I found in talking to people, it's one of the most impactful and noticeable upgrades as far as that immersive experience is adding those height channels. So uh, something to consider for sure. Sounds good. I'm in. <laughs> um, so before we let you go, I did want to throw it out there and uh, see if you had anything you're working on or anything you'd like to promote that's coming down the pipeline uh, as far as, uh, you know, outside of uh, the Audiophile Happy Hour uh, that maybe people will be interested in. I am working on um, an extremely cool project that's been in the works for 10 plus months. I can't give you guys too many details on it, but it's in the documentary space and it's in the sports space. Um, and I will be more than happy to come on and talk to you guys about it when I when we kind of um, get a little further down the road. We just started shooting uh, about two weeks ago, and this is my first time ever involved in anything that has to do with uh, TV or film. So I'm really excited about it. Well, we love a good. So when you're and ready and you can talk about it, and probably when when all of us can can actually see it, we sh we we would love to have you come back and tell us about it. Awesome. Yeah, I'd love to. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Glendon Rush, you can find him on Twitter, at Glendon Rush, full name. Uh, very uh, involved in all sorts of baseball-related activities, great insights, and uh, just a, a real pleasure to have you on, Glendon, and I look forward to talking to you down the road. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Glendon, thanks, thanks for doing our show. You're always just a, a pleasure to um, get your insights and hear what you have to say. Uh, thank you. It was a lot of fun and great to see you guys. And uh, for all the SVS uh, fans and owners out there, enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks, Thanks Glendon. All right. It's uh, great, man. It's fun so, to have him on there. That, that, I mean, we always have good guests, but that half hour just goes by so quickly with Glendon. You, I, I know, know, and I wish we could do a whole baseball hour, but I get it. I get it. We can. Uh, we I get quiet. I, yeah, I kind of had to switch people. you, Nick. I mean, these people are not, but I still, I, I could too. I love baseball. I, had like 20 more questions I wanted to ask him, but we're going to do another uh, throwback uh, question from uh, a previous topic you wanted, we talked about. We haven't, another we, giveaway? I think, well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin your rhythm, <laughs> but we, we have two more giveaways, usually maybe one, one in the next minute or two. 
Yep, I'm uh, making sure we get that set up. And like I said, I'll announce them all at the end again because I know there was some glitchiness going on, which we will address here, uh, you know, after the broadcast. So well, yeah, we'll um, figure it out. Sorry for that we, problem. A couple of broadcasts ago, we did a, a conversation, sort of a glossary definitions, and uh, there was a, a couple follow up questions to uh, the the concept of soundstage that I wanted to throw out there and get some insights from you, uh, gentlemen, on. And John Ray asked, and I'll throw this one to you, Gary. How can you improve your soundstage with equipment that you already have without upgrading your equipment? What can you do to enha enhance the soundstage? So that's an excellent question. And, and um, the way, it, first, I've talked about why soundstage gets created. It gets created because the two front speakers are in perfect sync with each other. And for that reason, the amount of signal of, of like a voice or a guitar or whatever that's sent re relative to each one creates a point in space where you hear it. So the higher quality of the speakers and the more the more accurate they are, the, the better and tighter the soundstage will be. But the question is, how can I have the best possible soundstage without getting new speakers or without spending money? And that's a, an outstanding question. And you can do that. Here's what I would do. The most important thing you can do short of getting the best possible speakers you can is limit the speaker's ability to interact with anything other than your ears. And so what that means is uh, we talked, uh, la I think it was last show or maybe the show before that about toe in where you're basically angling the speakers so that they aim at your ears. Um, and so therefore the, 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 um, most of the sound that you're hearing is, is, is sound that is coming directly from the drivers of the speakers to your ears. But the other piece of it is you want to limit any reflections that you can from the ceiling, the floor, and the walls. And you can do that by, number one, the easy way is to move the speakers as far as possible from any of the room boundaries. And secondly, hang things like my silly Peruvian tapestry, hang <laughs> things on your walls um, to limit reflections. By doing that, the toe in, the aiming at your ears, the moving it away from uh, walls and boundaries and hanging um, uh, non-reflective fabrics or other uh, materials on your walls at places where the reflections would ba would bang into your ears, that would be a way to do um, to maximize your soundstage without investing in better equipment. Great answer. Nothing to add on to that. Uh, follow up on the soundstage topic, Larry, I'm going to throw this one to you. Okay. Uh, how does the subwoofer contribute to the soundstage? Well, I, I think one of my favorite demos to do when I'm either at a training or at an event uh, is to do demos with and without a subwoofer. Because when you are listening to something, whether it's music or a movie, and you don't have that low-end bass, uh, it's not as immersive. So by adding a subwoofer, you you can fill a space. You can create a, a better suite area for what you're watching. You are more likely to feel involved. And so if you get a subwoofer properly placed in a room, your entire experience elevates you get a larger sound stage you get a more immersive experience it it is more lifelike and it can totally change any pair of speakers regardless of brand of speakers regardless of brand of sub whenever you get that set up in there right you have a very different overall experience once it's set up and calibrated or uh, just adjusted properly it's a very different overall enjoyment opportunity so uh, I'm going to do a giveaway because we have two left and uh, about 10 minutes left here. So uh, our next giveaway is our SB1000 Pro subwoofer. And winner of that is Carl Smith. Congratulations, Carl Smith. Yay, Carl. Subwoofer coming your way. Um, our ISO award winning subwoofer, right? That's one, right. One of two yes, sir. that won the ISO award. That's right. Um, and uh, next question, we're going to go sort of rapid fire. I think these are going to be some quick ones. But uh, Kevin Kipling asks, and Gary, I'm throwing this one to you. Does the length of speaker wire matter in terms of your performance of your home theater? And I assume that means if you have rear surrounds that are like 50 feet away, like does the length of the speaker wire matter? 
Well, you want to get me started on cable. There's so many things to talk about on that on that topic. Um, here's what I think. I think you want to have high quality speaker interconnect um, and you want the runs to be as short as possible. But the idea that someone would hear a difference in cable length to surround speakers is, I think, super unlikely. I've certainly never heard that in a rear surround speaker. Um, I would say that it's good to have um, high, high, relatively high performance speaker wire going, especially to your fronts and, uh, and your center, um, because they are really delivering the full on, uh, the, 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 the full content um, uh, of the theater. And then of course, if you're listening in two channel, um, the, the front uh, left and right speakers have a very important job to do. Um, but for someone to tell you, you need to get really expensive speaker wire for the rear speakers uh, seems um, self-serving, I guess, would be my answer. And there are things you can do within the AV receiver. Is that right, Larry? Where if you do, you know, you're noticing a delay there, there's, you know, that's why you I don't think wire, off. I don't think wire length causes a delay. No, I, I think what you run into, I, I if think you're noticing you'd, you'd something, to, the electrons are traveling at the speed of light. Yeah, so I, I think I, the I only think thing so. that would impact a run is if maybe one of them is a pretty quiet run along a wall or through a wall with uh, with no electrical, and maybe the other side has a ton of electrical stuff or uh, things that can impact the signal path. But beyond that, I, I don't think you're going to notice anything. But really where most of us... Uh, try to get a little bit more out of the rear speakers is just bumping up the gain to them and the receiver well, bumping know, up the channel levels too. You know, I, I have to agree with these commenters. I didn't say this, but I agree with this, these people. I think having a heavy gauge wire is a good idea. 12 gauge wire is, is a, that's a good call. And doesn't have, that doesn't have to be expensive. And um, um, so the, your commenters, you're right. Your, your answer enhances mine. I like it. So Joe Bailey asks, he's uh, he's seriously considering upgrading his 5.1 uh, with prime elevations uh, for height effects, Dolby Atmos height effects. And should he be concerned about voice matching with the front and center channel? Larry, I'm going to throw that one to you, assuming he's well, got different we, brand speakers on his front. Yeah, side. I mean, the, the purpose of the elevation was to be able to work with really any speaker that's out there. It's a very neutral speaker. It's not an over-the-top. It's, it's not like... It needs to be paired with a horn or has to go with an SVS um, because of its neutral sound profile. You can put it in there with pretty much anything. And because it is a height effects based speaker, it's not taking on the same energy that your front speakers are. So it will absolutely blend with really anything you're going to throw out there. And if it's a height effects, whether it's front, middle, rear heights, uh, it would work great with a horn loaded speaker, a ribbon loaded speaker, a, uh, a regular tweeter like what we have in the uh, Prime or Ultra series where we've got the aluminum dome tweeter, it, it's going to work great with all of them. Well, we, and we do work to make all our speakers neutral, not just the Prime Elevation. But when you have a neutral speaker, um, it, it very likely will be a positive match with pretty much anything. Um, that said, uh, uh, I would I would suggest you want to get neutral speakers for your whole home theater, what, whatever brand you choose. Um, but our elevations are designed to match up with anything. So here's a question I can answer. Chris Jackson asks, "What's the most extravagant setup you guys have seen uh, involving SVS?" And uh, it's funny you ask that because we recently did a featured system with a, a gentleman named William, and he has 11 SVS subwoofers and 12 SVS speakers set up throughout his house, including six of them in his garage. And you can check that out on the Featured Systems uh, page of our site. Uh, it's quite an amazing home of uh, audio goodies he's got set up there. Uh, but I've also seen a hi-fi system that had some really massive tower speakers paired with six SB16 Ultra subwoofers. So those are two of the most extreme ones that I've come across. I don't know if you guys have seen anything uh, that could top that, but uh, you know, certainly people really do take their audio seriously and they like to build these extreme systems, which I love to see. Well, yeah, one thing I do them. like is yeah. when I see, and uh, my own uh, my own system has, is putting really high-end front-end electronics on our speakers, which are relatively affordable. So I have a Mark Levinson uh, 
power amp that's an absolute stunningly good power amplifier. And I have a, uh, I just refurbed and put a new cartridge on my Lin Sondek turntable, which is a really great classic turntable. Um, and I ha also have a Mark Levinson preamp, which is a classic on number 26 preamp. Um, listening to that combination, and right now I have prime pinnacles in there. It's just so joyful to hear how good our speakers can sound with really great electronics. Now, of course, we designed them so they would work well with, with um, a portable receiver. That's the, the first purpose. They need to sound good with normal stuff. But it's fun to, to hear how good they can sound with, with state-of-the-art reference um, front end. Larry, do you have something to add there? No, I was turning off an alarm I had on my phone. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Larry's setting his alarm. Well, I have a like, question that's watch. directed to you. I'm afraid he was going to fall asleep during my answer. <laughs> <laughs> not, uh, not with that big jug of uh, cherry cola you got there. Um, no, this is just I, water. Okay, well, your your glass is always uh, you, you got that retro sonic glass there. Yeah, he's uh, always his glass is always filled with something neither you nor I would ever want to drink. Nor do I. Yeah, there's a mystery <laughs> fluid in there that uh, you know you say is water. But Nick, you knows? are a huge cherry coke. Uh, oh, I am so big I time. That. Uh, so this question is directed directly to you, Larry. Uh, you talk about setting the main speakers to small anytime you have a subwoofer. Are there exceptions? Uh, and he says, for the first time, his Yamaha set them to large, and the system started to sound better than ever. He has a PB1000 with uh, Dahlquist M905 mains. Um, and so he wants to know, is there exceptions to the rule of when you're running a subwoofer, whether you should be at large or small? I, I think it's going to come down to the equipment you're using itself. Um, I would say most conventional towers probably would always need to be set to small. If they don't have large drivers in them over eight inches, it should be set to small. And that's just kind of the conventional thought across the industry. Uh, you know, we should save that question. Ed has a really articulate answer why you want to do that. I, I don't know what, if we're going to have him on our next show, but, but um, there's a reason why you do it. It's not just that um, we're just saying you should do it and the speakers can't do it. It's because by agreeing with what the receiver tells you about small speakers, there's um, uh, uh, the correct amount of low frequency information is being directed at the subwoofer. And if you mess with that, you get a gap. So um, I'd like Ed to answer that too. I agree, by the way, Larry, I'm not trying to in any way, you know, diss your answer. your answer. I agree with your answer, but let's let Ed riff on that next show. I'm totally on board, and Ed will be with us for the next broadcast, and uh, I will get to that in a minute. But I love this suggestion by Bill Whitman, and uh, maybe I'm putting you guys on the spot, but he's suggesting that we let people send in pictures of their setups, and then we offer suggestions on better placement of the speakers. <laughs> maybe that could get us in some hot water. We don't oh, want to nitpick, man. but uh, I mean, I like I like the concept of uh, you know choosing what we can do to help people get the best performance possible uh, because I, th I know Ed has uh, at least a million tips that we could offer. Um, so before we get Is to that our like final, the rate my meal, the people that I know it kind of feels like they're like, tell yeah. me how awful this looks. Yeah, I know, I'm, I'm, so wonder, I'm wondering if that would work. There's so much that goes Maybe into it. Maybe we pick one and see how that goes. <laughs> we'll pick the worst one and then we'll be like, all right, here's our, uh, you know, basket case. of. Oh, you're talking. Uh, no, that's different. Are you saying we get people setups and just throw grapefruits at them and make fun of them? <laughs> Not make fun of them. Offer helpful placement and setup tips that will optimize performance. That's the uh, PC, right. uh, the okay. PR answer right there. Um, but again, thank you. Um, apologies again for any of the glitches. If you are tuning in on Facebook, we're going to get that fixed. I'm going to quickly run through all the giveaways before we do the last one. Uh, so our first winner of the Prime Wireless Powered Speaker System was Paul Corey. The second Prime Wireless System was John Klein. Our Prime Elevation Speakers was Roger Coble. And the SB1000 Pro was Carl Smith. So uh, thank you all for tuning Congratulations, in. Congratulations, folks. Sorry for the glitches. It's yep. I think it's that platform we use that, that puts it out on both YouTube and Facebook. And we'll yeah, figure it, it out. Yeah, it seemed to be limited to Facebook, show. but we'll get it we'll, we'll get it fixed for next time. Uh, and next time will be Thursday, November 18th. So I guess this will be our Thanksgiving edition of the Audiophile Happy Hour. So we'll have some more fun giveaways that night. Uh, so I hope... Everyone will tune in then. Our winner of the 3000 micro subwoofer for tonight is Joseph Humane. Joseph Humane, congratulations. congratulations. If we get a note from Vince, we'll get all your info and uh, get that shipped out here within the next couple of days. So 
Thank you to Glenn and Russ for joining Joseph. us. Love talking baseball. Hopefully we'll have him on again. And thanks to our community again for turning out. We love you guys, and uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Great being with you All guys. Everybody.